And kids are welcome to hang out in the library if so desire. They're welcome to stay here. Just don't make fun of me. <laughs> Philippians chapter 4. And let's pray. <clears throat> Father, again, we thank you. We thank you that we can gather here tonight and we can glorify you. We can praise you. It is the month of November, Lord. Thanksgiving is around the corner and let us have thankful hearts. Help us to focus on those things that you are doing in our lives that we can praise you for, that we can be thankful about. So we ask that you be here with us tonight. We, that we ask that you would abide with us tonight. Open our hearts, open our minds, open our ears to what you have for us. And guide us through your scripture. Guide us through your word. And it's in your great name, Jesus, we pray. Everyone said, Amen. Philippians chapter 4. Look at verse 6. So do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Hmm. George Mueller once said, the beginning of anxiety is the end of faith. But he also said, said the beginning of true faith is the end of anxiety. We're pausing our study through the book of Judges these next few weeks to focus on a couple of things, a couple of topics I believe the Lord wants us to look at. And the first one we'll discuss tonight is that topic of anxiety, or as some of our Bibles might translate it, worry or fretting. And why are we talking about this tonight? Because there's a lot of stuff out there to worry about. There's a lot of things going on to be anxious about. And I believe the Lord wants to remind us that he's still with us, that he's still on the throne, and that is where our eyes need to be fixed. That's where our gaze needs to be, is on him. That's where we need to direct our hearts. Because there is a lot going on in our world. Right? We still have a war in Ukraine. That's still going on. We have a war in Israel now. That seems to be dividing our own nation. We have another presidential election just around the corner. Right? Inflation is in our midst. Food prices are going up. Gas prices keep fluctuating. Right? Groceries are more expensive. COVID might be going around again. RSV is out there. And that's just the stuff that's going on around us in the world. Stuff that can cause us to be worried or anxious. But we also have things going on in our own life that we may be worrying about, anxious about, fretting over. And we as a people are really good, the best there is at being anxious, at being worried. Somebody says something to us, we see or read something on the news, and then after reading it, we immediately start to worry about it or fret over it, we become anxious. And according to a recent study, anxiety disorders are some of the most commonly diagnosed mental conditions in the U.S., affecting 42.5 million adults. That's a lot of people. And there was an article with the American Psychiatric Association back in December of 2022 with the title, Americans Anticipate Higher Stress at the Start of 2023. And that's kind of a funny title to me. That's kind of a funny article. Because it says Americans anticipate higher stress, but anticipate is just a fancy word for worry or anxiety. Americans are worried about higher stress at the start of 2023. And so we worry, we fret, we get anxious really well, but God's word tonight is going to show us that we don't need to be anxious. Scripture will show us how to overcome anxiety. And we're going to receive some guidance on how to do that, how to overcome worry. 
and not be subdued by it or burdened by those thoughts or those feelings or those emotions, but to know what to do when it comes. Look at verse 6 one more time. <clears throat> it says, do not be anxious about anything. So we'll pause right there. <laughs> The first thing we find to help overcome anxiety is that we are commanded to not be anxious. To not be anxious about anything. We are told to stop it. Don't do it. Years ago, the comedian Bob Newhart, he may be familiar to some of you, um, he had a little skit where he played a psychiatrist. And the patient would come into his office and sit down across from him at his desk where the patient shared her fear her worry, that she was afraid of being buried alive in a box. And it made, her, it made it hard for her to function and live a normal life. So Bob Newhart, the psychiatrist, informed the woman, I'm going to give you two words to help you that you can take with you throughout your day. So the lady gets her pen and, and paper out, getting ready to write down what he's going to say. And so Bob, the psychiatrist, is going to, to say a couple of words. And so he leans forward to tell the woman the two words. And so he leans forward and he yells, stop it, stop it. And so the lady being somewhat confused says, what do you mean? Bob replies, you're claustrophobic, right? Afraid of enclosed spaces. And she says, yes, that's it. And so Bob says, stop it, stop being claustrophobic. We're told to do the same, to stop it. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 25, Jesus would tell or command us of the same thing. Jesus said, do not be anxious about your life. Don't be anxious over anything. Don't worry about anything. Don't fret over anything. We are to stop. We are to stop it. And you might say, well, pastor, that's easy for you to say. And you're right. It is easy to say. It's easy, very easy to say. It's much harder to do. And in a little bit, we'll talk, we'll talk about what to do, but we need to understand why we need to stop. We need to understand why the reasoning behind it. And that's because it's fruitless. It's fruitless. It's a waste of your time. It's a waste of my time. It's a waste of energy and resources. It robs you of your joy. It robs you of your sleep and causes undue stress on, our, on your physical and emotional health. Again, according to researchers, roughly about 8% of the things people worry about actually come true. 8%. In other words, less than 1 in 10 things you worry about, you are stressed about, was actually worth it. Was actually fruitful. Jesus himself tells us it's a waste of time. Uh, in Matthew chapter 6, flip over there to the left just a little bit. Matthew chapter 6. So Matthew chapter 6, look at verse 27. Jesus says, And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? Which one of us can live any an hour longer by worrying about our life? Being anxious about our lives, the answer is no one. No one. If anything, it would most likely take hours away because of the amount of stress on our bodies. But what is our Lord saying? He's saying it's fruitless, it's a waste of time, and there's nothing to gain from being anxious, from being stressed about our life, the stuff going on in our lives and around our lives going on in this world. It's a waste of our energy, energy that needs to be spent on something greater, which we'll talk about in a few moments. But now this doesn't mean that we, we have to give up all responsibilities or we have to stop making plans. That's not what Paul is saying here. He's just telling us to give up that anxiety, to let it go, let go of that worry because it gains us nothing. There's no added benefit for us with being anxious. And there's a lot of worry. There's a lot to worry about in and around us. And understand, I'm not trying to minimize the situations or the circumstances or make fun of them, but what we do need to understand 
is that the vast majority of what we worry about isn't worth it. There's nothing to be gained from it. And so what are we to do? What are we to do? Flip back over to Philippians chapter 4. <clears throat> Look at verse 6 again. This is how we do things around here at Calvary Chapel. One word or one verse at a time. So verse 6, he says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. So we are commanded not to be anxious. That was our first step. Not to worry, but how do we stop? By turning to prayer and supplication. That is our second step. When those anxieties, our worries begin to rise, when we read something or hear something that puts us on edge, instead of fretting over it, we need to pray. We need to go to God in prayer. Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, pray. We need to replace the fret for the Father. Instead of, our first, res of res instead of first responding with, um, about something that comes our way, we are to pray. We are to pray, to seek God. Going to Him needs to be our first response. And again, Jesus told us to do the same thing back in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Flip back over there again. Matthew chapter 6. Verse 33. Jesus says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Seek first. Our first course of action is to seek God first. Go to him first, instead of going into panic mode right off the bat. We have to begin to talk to God, to communicate with him. When we, find, when we found out about the attacks in, on Israel from Hamas a few weeks ago and the subsequent war that ensued, what did the church do? The church started to pray. It was a call to prayer, to seek God. When we get an unexpected bill in the mail, when money is a little tight and Christmas is just around the corner, when there is a family, there's stress in the family, when our health isn't as good as it should be or we want it to be, we are to not panic, but pray. Seek God first. But why? Why do we go to God? Because He's God. He's God. He's the creator of the heavens and the earth. He's all-powerful. He is sovereign, meaning He is com in complete control over all things. All things, including your life, including mine. And understand this, that there is no single area of your life that he is not concerned about. He's concerned about all of you. Every aspect, every area. Paul wrote, in everything pray, not just the bad stuff, but also the good stuff and all the other stuff in between. In everything pray. The biggest reason why we panic, why we worry, why we get anxious is because we like to be in control, don't we? I got this. I can handle this. We like to be in control. But then we realize, I'm not in control. I can't handle this. And we begin to panic. And I've shown you this before. We like to do this. We like to do this. We like to hold on and be in control. But what Paul is saying is we need to do this. We need to let go. We need to let go and give it to the one who is in control, our Father who is in heaven. We need to let go, and it's a step of faith. It's a step of faith. Going to God and letting go of the control, trusting in Him and not yourself, especially in times of great difficulty. It takes faith. What is the opposite of faith? Fear. Panic, worry, anxiety. 
But we need to go to Him and let Him know what we need. That's supplication. Prayer is our broad word for communicating with God, but supplication is our direct ask of God for what we need. But how many of our prayers go unanswered because we don't ask? How many prayers are out there that have not been stated? James remind, uh, reminds us in his letter, uh, James chapter 4, verse 2, he says, You have not because you ask not. You have not because you ask not. How many prayers are out there that are unanswered? And so Paul reminds us to make our requests known. God wants to hear from us. Cast all your cares on him, for he cares for you. God wants to hear it, and he wants to answer. We're invited to go before the Lord and let our requests be made known to him. And God's word tells us that we can be assured that he hears us and that, if, that we have the requests that we asked of him. That's powerful. Don't forget that. He hears us and we have the requests that we ask of him. That's powerful. But the key here is to ask. The key is to ask. And to ask with a thankful heart, a heart of gratitude or appreciation for all that God has done for you. And sometimes we forget what the Lord has done for us. We forget how faithful he has been to us before. In days or years past, and when we forget, we worry. We get anxious. We become anxious about what is in front of us right now, what we're dealing with right now or what we have to face or deal with now, which is why I'm encouraging all of us, even myself, that as a church, as a body, we pray, thanking God for all that he has done. We need to be reminded of that. There's a lot going on in this world, and there's a lot going on in your life. And so we need to be reminded of God's faithfulness to us. He put a meal on our table tonight. Praise God. He's given us clothes, a job, another day with a loved one. Yes, even those little things that we might take for granted because we need to remember that God has provided for us. He's provided for us before and he will provide for us again. And no greater need that we can be truly grateful and thankful to God for without a doubt is his only begotten son, Jesus. Flip over to Romans chapter 8 real quick, to the left a little bit. Romans chapter 8. Look at verse 31. <clears throat> it says, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? No greater reason to remember and be thankful for as we pray than that of God, not sparing even his own Son, Jesus Christ, for us all. No greater reason to remember and no greater reason to be thankful. God so loved you that he gave you his Son. The Father fulfilled our greatest need by sending Jesus to forgive us of our sin that leads to death. It was Jesus who hung on that cross with nails piercing his hands and his feet, incurring the wrath of God for my sin and for your sin, so that we would no longer be faced with death, but given life, and life more abundantly. Above all else, we should be thankful for the blood of Christ that was shed for us, and there's no greater reason to be thankful. No greater reason. And do you know, you know why when we pray to the Father, we do so in Jesus' name? Why do we use Jesus' name? Because of the cross. 
because of the cross and what he did for us, dying for our sin and restoring us into fellowship with the Father, giving us access to God so we can pray to him, so we can make our requests known to him. And so praying in Jesus' name also reminds us to be thankful as we make our requests. God provided us his son. He gave us his son. And so going back to our text in Romans 8 here, if God did not spare even his own son, how will he not graciously give us all things? What is our writer talking about? It happens to be Paul again. Um, but Paul, what's he saying? He said that God fulfilled our greatest need by giving us his son. And if God did not withhold even his son, why would he withhold those things that we need, which are worth far, far less? So ask. Make your requests known to God remembering his faithfulness to you and providing for our lives, for your life, not just through food or water or clothing, but also through his son, Jesus, who was given to us all, provided to us all to fulfill our greatest need. And so what is the result of when we stop being anxious and turn to the Lord in prayer? What do we have instead? We have peace. We have God's peace. Look at verse 7. <clears throat> Back in Philippians. And there, Paul writes, he says, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. When we stop being anxious and we turn to the Lord in prayer and make our requests known to him with a thankful heart, then we have peace. Not just any peace. The Bible says it's the peace of God. Not a peace of God, it's the peace of God. <laughs> but that's part of his nature. It's who God is. He is a God of peace, and it's part of the fruit from his Holy Spirit, right? Fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, and what? Peace. Peace. Peace being that state of tranquility or quietness in our spirit that transcends any of our circumstances. That's God's peace. Which surpasses all understanding. There's no words for it, you just have to experience it. You have to experience it. How do we experience it? Well, we kind of already mentioned it. We have to turn to God. We have to draw close to Him. The farther away from the Lord I am, the less peace I will have. Worry and anxiety are the enemy of peace. They are opposites of each other. And so we need to understand where to find peace. It's from God. And as we're studying through Judges, the people of Israel would turn away from the Lord, get into trouble, be oppressed, but when they cried out to God, turned back to Him, and He would save them, what would happen? They would have rest. They found rest, or they had peace. Away from the Lord, they had no peace. Abiding with the Lord, they found peace. Peace that surpasses all understanding. And it's hard to explain, but very real in the lives of those who trust in the Lord. And it's peace that guards our hearts. And it guards our minds in Christ Jesus. God's peace protects us protects our heart and our minds. Again, the farther away from the Lord we are, the less protected we will be. The less protection we'll have over us, our, over our heart and minds. Isn't that interesting, though? Where does anxiety and worry and panic and fear tend to get stirred up? It's in our hearts and our minds. When you are just exhausted by bedtime and you lay down and your head hits the pedal, pe uh, pillow, Normally, you're supposed to fall asleep. But for some of us, your mind just turns back on. You start thinking about your day, what happened, what you said, or maybe what you shouldn't have said. Something about work, what they need to get done the next day, maybe worrying about bills or finances or family members. 
God's peace protects us from our minds from going crazy with the worries and the anxieties. And His peace guards our hearts too. It guards our heart. And our heart is a powerful force that drives our actions and influences our thinking and behavior. Our heart can lead us down the path of righteousness, or it can lead us to destruction, to lead us astray. So we must be on guard from what comes into our lives, what we allow into our hearts, because our actions will follow from it. And the Bible tells us God's peace will also help to protect our heart from what darkness may be trying to enter, trying to make its way into our hearts. And again, the further removed I am from the Father, the less protection I have from those influences that will lead me down the wrong path. And so we have to draw near to God. And our prayer life is one of the most beneficial, most easy ways to do it. Along with church and Bible study, prayer, our prayer life is essential. <clears throat> And sadly, though, we don't take advantage of it enough. We can do better, especially in times in the times we're living in. We need to be praying. And so lastly, where do we find the source of peace? Where do we find God's peace? Paul tells us it's in Christ Jesus. Only through Jesus can we receive God's peace, and it's only through Jesus we can come to the Father in prayer and make our requests known. Only through Jesus can we overcome anxiety, overcome worry, overcome fear, overcome depression. But we have to believe. We have to believe that God sent His Son, Jesus, to us so He could take our place on that cross and die for us, removing our sin, so we could be reunited with God again, so we could have a relationship with Him. And be able to come to Him in times of distress and anxiety and worry and pray, asking God for what we need with a heart that is thankful for His faithfulness and receive His peace. Peace that surpasses all understanding, but able to keep the heart calm in the midst of a raging storm. Peace that protects our heart and mind from those influences that will lead us back into the madness and the craziness of this life. All we need is Jesus, putting our life in His faithful hands. Church, there's a lot of stuff going on these days. There's a lot of things to worry about. And that's not just in the world, even in our lives too. There's a lot going on. But we don't have to be anxious. We don't have to worry. We can stop worrying because we have someone we can turn to who will take care of all of our needs. We have our Heavenly Father. So go to Him. Seek Him. Turn to Him and away from the worry. And let Him know what you need. And receive His peace. Turn over to Numbers chapter 6, way to the left, Old Testament, big turns. Numbers chapter 6. This is one of my favorite verses, and we'll finish up with this verse tonight and head into communion. But Numbers chapter 6, look at verse 24. And by the way, as I read this, keep in mind, I'm reading this blessing for you, church. This is for you. Numbers chapter 6, verse 24. says, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Peace. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we can come to you 
We thank you that we can come to you and that you hear our prayers, that you give us what we need, and that we don't have to be anxious, but we can have peace. Thank you so much for your faithfulness in our lives. Thank you for your son, who we remember tonight with communion. And Lord, for those who have come here tonight with anxious hearts, heavy hearts, worried hearts, may they hand over their anxiety, their worry to you. And may you replace it with your peace. We love you and we praise you. And everyone said, Amen. All right, it's communion tonight. We get to celebrate that and remember that. Feel free to partake.